Welcome to Great Loop Radio, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, and dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. This is Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. Today we're doing something um, a little bit different. I don't believe we've ever done this before, but I've got Karen Nettles from the Homeport crew joining me today. And we're going to give you a little bit of a rundown of the many things that are happening with AGLCA and around the loop. So a bit of a state of the association, if you will, for January after our holiday hiatus. Before we jump into the content for today, I do wanna take a moment to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes and Associates, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. And with that out of the way, Karen Nettles, thank you for joining me on Great Loop Radio. I know you've been here before when we have something big going on, um, but thanks for, for being here today. Well, well, you're quite welcome. I'm glad to be able to help you out and do this when we have things to promote for AGLCA. We sure do. Lots of things going on. Well, I know, as you said, you wanted to kind of do a, a state of the association address here as we've recapped the look at 2020, which has been a most unusual year, not only for us, but for everybody in the in the world. Um, so let's start there. You know, what do you want to kind of say about 2020 and how unusual it was? Obviously, very unusual year and um, COVID created a lot of challenges for loopers besides, you know, when it first really started to break in March, some marinas closed, um, you know, there was not a procedure for handling things. Um, the keys basically closed. It was a pretty uh, difficult time, a pretty challenging time. So at that point, we did have a lot of loopers who were in progress who decided to stop, um, either trailer the boat home, left the boat where it was and went home, particularly our Canadian members. We've got several Canadian members who left their boats in Florida, stored them and went home to Canada where they knew their health care was covered. So created all kinds of wrinkles for lots of people. Add to that, that the New York State canals, which typically open in kind of mid to late May, did not open until August. And that was a COVID um, uh, it happened because of COVID. When it first broke, they sent the workers home who were doing the maintenance. And it was several months before they could come back and finish up the winter maintenance and open. And of course, the Canadian border remains closed. So that was yet another challenge. Um, loopers who perhaps planned to go to Canada and didn't have uh, uh, their, their clearance was not low enough to get all the way through the Erie Canal were kind of left struggling. And add to all that, that they finally got to the Illinois Waterway and the closures were happening there. And, and the good news of all of that is that the Illinois Waterway lot closures and maintenance did happen as scheduled, did open as scheduled. Um, there was a much smaller crowd waiting to come through because of COVID. Um, but early in the year, you know, everyone, and really leading up to 2020, all through 2018 and 2019, everybody thought the big story for looping was gonna be the Illinois waterway closure. Ended up not being that big of a deal because so many people either uh, stopped their loop or uh, chose to put it off for another year. But the end result of all of that, we still had 104 boats who reported completion of the loop in 2020 to us, which is a pretty big number. Um, it's the lowest we've had in about five or so years. In 2019, I wanna say it was 172. So down significantly, but given all of the challenges, the number of people who actually did report completion in 2020 was a pretty good number and it was still over 100. So that was kind of neat. Um, we actually had two people also complete their platinum loop or two boats i should say complete their platinum loop so went around for the second time um, as of january 1st our database showed that there were 567 boats in progress on the loop now people hear that and it sounds like an enormous number and they think they're going to get out there and it's going to be too crowded that's been pretty consistent over the years in our database is that it's somewhere between 500 and 600 members choose what in progress means to them. So for example, if I'm boating and living here in Charleston, South Carolina, which is on the loop, I may consider myself in progress while I'm doing my local boating, or perhaps I'm you know, doing the ICW snowboarding in different years. So I may be in progress. So that 567, I don't want that to strike panic in anyone's eyes who is perhaps planning to do the loop in 2021 and thinking you're not gonna find dockage. It's a pretty consistent number. Um, also what stayed consistent is that the average boat in our database is 40.5 feet. Uh, that I think is up like 0.1 foot from the previous year. But for as long as we've kind of tracked these statistics, the average 
of the boats in our database is 40 feet and that's remained as well. And finally, the last kind of little fun fact statistic is that at the close of 2020, we had almost 4,400 active memberships in AGLCA. So those are the folks that are either planning or in progress or have finished the loop and are gold loopers who have joined us as lifetime members and are basically acting as resources for everyone else. So it's a growing number. I believe it, the overall membership number grew by about 10% in 2020. So that's kind of a quick wrap up. Definitely an unusual year that will certainly go down in the record books and kudos to all of you who actually stuck with it and finished the loop in 2020. I should mention that the March issue of Passage Maker Magazine is dedicated to the Great Loop and there will be a list of those boats recognized there. So definitely check that out when it, it arrives for you. Well, that'll be a nice keepsake for those folks that did complete the loop because yeah, it was absolutely. a most unusual year. So they've certainly got a story to tell, but uh, with definitely. all the statistics, if I can get it out, statistics <laughs> that you just mm -hmm. shared, I mean, it still was a successful year despite all the obstacles. So it just shows that people are still interested in the loop and going to make it happen one, one way or the other. So it we definitely, still, yep, shows where there's a will, there's a way for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, like I said, despite all that, 2020 looked really good and what, what occurred in 2020. So now that we're in 2021, um, what can we expect this year for the association and the loopers out there? Yeah. Um, Definitely still some unknowns out there, and I'll start with events. Looper Palooza is coming up at the end of this month. Um, Looper Palooza is a pretty popular event that happens in Fort Myers most of the time, most years, and it's grown from where it was once just a Gold Looper reunion to celebrate our Gold Loopers, and it would draw 30 to 50 attendees, has grown into an event with three different tracks, um, last year drawing, I think, pretty close to 300 people. Um, and that was actually the last face-to-face -face event we were able to hold before the pandemic started was Looper Palooza in 2020. Um, we have made the decision that Looper Palooza in 2021 will have to be virtual in order to make sure that our members and our staff can stay safe. So it is Tuesdays and Thursday evenings starting February 26th, which is just right around the corner. Uh, regular registration is actually closed, but we are taking late registrations for a few more days. Um, we're going to close that completely on January 19th, which is Tuesday. Um, if you register between now and then, you will be registered. You'll be able to attend everything. We just can't guarantee that we can get you your Looper Palooza t-shirt because those of course have to be ordered way in advance. And we can't get you your welcome kit, which is something we physically ship to you before the event starts. We will get it to you, but it just won't be there for the start of the 26th most likely. So that's the only difference with the late registrations. So that's Looper Palooza. Um, other events, somewhat uncertain, and I'm sorry to say that because we are probably more eager than anyone else to get back to having face-to-face -face events. The next large-scale planned event is our Spring Rendezvous, which is the first week in May in Norfolk. We are cautiously optimistic that that will be a face-to-face -face event. However, the state of Virginia currently has restrictions on group gatherings that I believe the max is 10 people. Obviously, we can't do a rendezvous under that circumstance. That current order expires January 31st. So we'll see with, with numbers spiking in different areas of the country, we'll see what Virginia does with that order, whether it's extended or if it's allowed to expire. If it's extended, that's probably going to be a bad indication for having a face-to-face -face spring rendezvous because, as you might imagine, these things take quite a bit of time to plan. Typically, registration opens 90 days in advance, which would be right around February 1st, which is right around the time that order could possibly be extended. Really difficult for us to plan a face-to-face -face event, take registrations, book speakers, confirm facilities, if we don't know if the state of Virginia will allow us to have it. And if we go much past, you know, 60 days before the event, it becomes too much of a challenge to be able to do all of that planning in time. So February will be telling for the spring rendezvous. Also on the calendar, of course, is our annual um, fall rendezvous in October. We really hope that by then there's no question and we're moving forward. And if um, the pandemic situation allows, we will sprinkle in a few of our looper lifestyles in between those like we usually do. Obviously, we haven't done those in a year. It's just um, still a bit uncertain in that area. So that's what 2020 is lo looking like event wise. I wish we had more set in stone. Uh, trust me, I really wish we did. Um, but right now we're just still 
still waiting to get that all all figured out. Um, but Looperpalooza is the next one, and it is virtual. Okay, so like I said, we'll just have to take it one day at a time, like the rest of the world, as exactly. figured out as we as we go. But at least we have the technology and the the ability to do virtual events. You know, it may not be ideal and not be in person, but it does allow the content to get out there and keep the members engaged. So right. I'm sure they're appreciative of that. Right. Um. I know we had a slight dues increase at the end of the year. It was announced just going from the end of the year going into January. So, uh, what are the that uh, what is that dues increase going to be used for? Some of yeah. the members may be interested. It's a small increase, and and we put it out there. Probably got it more attention than it really even deserved. <laughs> it's a four dollar increase, um, but we did want to let members know that it was happening. Um, it brings our membership dues to seventy nine dollars if you're a renewing member, and eighty nine dollars a year for a new member. Um, basically, it was time for us to raise the dues because we want to make some improvements. Um, and also, you know, it, the $4 is obviously not a significant amount for most of us. We wanted to keep it very small because we know it's been a rough year. So um, the $4 isn't necessarily going to get us a whole brand new website. I know that there's some navigation issues that we'll work to correct. We'll work on making improvements there, make some improvements to the look and feel of the forum. Um, those are the kind of things that we're after. Um, we're hoping to add a search function to the website because we know what's there now is not quite adequate. Um, so all that is going to go to web-based improvements. Now when we put that out there, um, some of the comments, which were very positive and we're appreciative of that, um, but indicated like, wow, the whole new website is going to be great. And <laughs> I don't want to overpromise because it's, it's really just not intended to be a whole new website and a $4 increase is not going to get us that. So stick with us. We'll be putting out some more information um, and we're gathering some details right now about finalizing what the most important changes might be. And we'll take that $4 increase as far as we possibly can on implementing improvements. Well, speaking of uh, member comments and improvements and so forth, I know we just opened a member survey. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what you hope to do with the information that's gained from that? Yes, and this is kind of our first full scale mem member survey in several years. So if you're a member, if you have not seen an email with a link to the survey, please reach out to us because we really want your feedback on this. Um, and that is really what we're going to use to drive all of the improvements that we can make in 2021. And that's, you know, where that $4 will go, but also other improvements that we can make internally with our current resources. Um, so it's about a 10 minute survey. Again, super important to us that we get your feedback so we can plan these changes and make sure we're putting the resources to the places that are most important to our members. Um, and we are gonna give away three separate $100 Amazon gift cards. So if you answer the survey, enter yourself into the drawing at the end to be picked as one of the three winners of those gift cards. So just a little incentive for us to uh, get your feedback and for you to provide that to us. And I think the deadline, actually, Karen, you might have to tell us what the deadline is to, to submit the survey. It's, it's Monday, uh, January 25th is the it's, last day to complete the survey. So, so you've that. got a little bit more time, um, another week to 10 days. So um, mm -hmm. if you can kind of uh, look for that. And again, if you don't see that, certainly let us know and we'll get you a link to provide us that feedback. Yeah. And we would certainly appreciate that for sure. Yeah. And, and I know we've had some people that have, uh, we've asked for suggestions and stuff for the podcast. So do you have any, uh, anything you're going to do differently with the podcast or, or how's that going to look for 2021? So if you're listening to this podcast on the normal platforms that you do, then you probably will not have noticed that there is video going along with it. Um, the audio will remain the same, but we are trying to make this available in more places. So we're recording it as video. So it will be on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook. Um, those of you who are listening to it as a podcast probably won't notice a change. Those of you who are watching the video, we're not promising anything engaging here whatsoever, <laughs> um, but we just wanted to give you a little bit more than just having a still shot running through the entire podcast. The other thing we're planning on doing, we did a Facebook Q&A a few nights ago, and there were several comments about the podcast and people enjoy it. So we do understand it's a great resource. It actually takes a lot more time than you might think to try and put it together weekly. So we'll do our best to bring it to you weekly. I know we aren't always successful in having one each and every week. But the other thing we plan to do 
is um, we're launching a, a series that we hope will eventually be bi-weekly, um, but it's called Doc Tales, and it will be on Facebook Live. So it's Doc Tales, and, and many of you know it's kind of a looper thing to have Doc Tales in the evening when everyone is tied up at a dock or at an anchorage. This is Doc Tales spelled T-A-L-E-S, so like stories. Um, and the point of the series of Doc Tales is to bring on a gold looper for each episode and just let them tell the story of their great loop. Um, it'll be an interview format somewhat like this podcast. And as I said, the, the primary channel for that will be Facebook Live, but we will record it. And then the audio from that will be more episodes of the podcast. So that may be something you'd be interested in listening to. You won't miss anything by having the audio version versus the video, because again, it's an interview format. We don't anticipate having slides or anything along that line. Um, so those will be released along with the regular episodes of the Great Loop Radio podcast. So that's what's up for 2021 for this podcast. We always are looking for your ideas. One of the most difficult and challenging parts of this is coming up with topics that are of interest. So if you have interested uh, topics that you'd like to hear, um, we have an email address for you to send that to. It's podcast at greatloop.org. So send those our way and we'll see if we can make them into an episode for you. All right. Sounds like there's a lot of great things coming up with the podcast and with social media. So I know folks will look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Kind of switching gears, um, advocacy is another big issue that we have. I know we are raising money for this year's advocacy fund. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us what issues uh, we can expect to be, voters can expect to be facing this year? We can do that, yes. And, and we are in the middle of our fundraising drive to fund the, some of those advocacy efforts. Um, there is a lot going on in the Southeast regarding abandoned and derelict vessels. And that continues to be the trend. It's very nice to see states addressing that issue because when they don't is when it seems to get wrapped up with anchoring. And we know that it's two very different issues. Um, so the state of Virginia has recently convened a task force to study the abandoned and derelict vessel issue. And I've been able to sit in on those committee calls, which has been interesting. Um, and I think they've got the right people grouped together to actually make some progress in that area. Um, Georgia, you may remember was a big challenge last year because of a law that actually passed in 2019 then took effect um, on January 1, 2020, that was very unfriendly to cruisers, particularly those who were looking to anchor. Um, that was rectified in the 2020 session and that new bill took effect immediately. But there are still areas that are closed to anchoring because of shellfish beds and leases for shellfish beds that are being issued. So there's been some, um, back and forth between our group that worked on that on behalf of cruisers and the Georgia Department of National, Nash, excuse me, Georgia <laughs> Department of Natural Resources, um, who is responsible for maintaining those leases and putting out the maps of where uh, cruisers can anchor in Georgia. Also part of the new law is that if you are anchoring um, for more than a certain number of cumulative days in one place, you need a permit. Um, I wish I could remember off the top of my head how many cumulative days that is, uh, but it's far more than most cruisers even spend in Georgia. Um, but I did talk to a looper today who was actually found out they were the first person to apply for that permit for extended anchoring in one place. Um, and since that's a brand new process, we're kind of working our way through that as well. But, um, you know, I'm happy to say that the state of Georgia did pass a much better cruising friendly law. And there had been lots of talks about boycotting the state. Um, that has been rectified, thanks to the advocacy efforts of cruisers, AGLCA included. Um, but the big issue, once again, which seems to be the perennial big issue, is expected to be Florida. And that's the primary reason for our fundraising. In order to be able to have our voices heard in Tallahassee, we have had to retain a lobbyist for the past several years. And he's done a phenomenal job representing our interests. Um, but each year, there are more municipalities that are trying to be added to a short list of places where overnight anchoring is prohibited. And because that code exists in the state statute, it's a pretty simple one page bill for more municipalities to try to be added to that. So we are constantly having to block that. Um, in the off seasons, so to speak, between the legislative sessions, our lobbyist has been working closely with the Department of Fish and Wildlife in Florida, which is responsible for um, implementation of voting laws. And they are bringing a bill to the legislature this year. So our interests have been represented with a seat at the table 
at FWC as all of these things are being hashed out. So we're still working towards that. Most recently in Florida, um, the city of Riviera Beach, which is near Stewart and is a very popular anchorage and jumping off point for going to the Caribbean, um, they are putting in or proposing putting in a series of mooring fields, which on the surface sounds actually like a good idea until you watch the video of their consultant presenting that um, to some of the city's citizens. Um, they're pretty blatant that they have designed the mooring fields to exclude anchoring. The current state code um, requires that you anchor at least 100 feet from the perimeter of a mooring field. Their consultant says he's going to FWC to try to get that increased to 500 feet, so you would not be able to anchor within 500 feet of a mooring field. And they specifically say that they designed the mooring fields the way that they did so that there's no room to anchor there. And it's pretty disturbing, in my opinion, when you watch the video, that there is this huge misconception that the boats there at anchor are dumping raw sewage and that the boats there at anchor are responsible for noise complaints and um, just all kinds of a host of things that we know responsible cruisers, which loopers by and large are, are not responsible for those issues. So to see a city trying to push anchoring out because of a few problem boats that are probably more in the abandoned and derelict vessel category than they are in the cruising category is really sad and is really a shame. And as someone who anchors overnight, um, I'm somewhat offended <laughs> by some of the things that they put out there. Um, so those are the kind of things that we are fighting with our advocacy efforts. Um, New York actually had some issues going on with the Erie Canal. That's all been on hold since they were initially one of the hot spots for COVID. Um, but that we are expecting to kind of ramp up again as the pandemic starts to trail off. So lots going on on advocacy. We really need your help. If you have not contributed yet, please visit greatloop.org slash contribute. Any small amount helps us to be able to fund these efforts and we really appreciate it. This might be a good time, Karen, if we just take a quick break and play a message from one of our sponsors. Does that sound okay to you? Yep, that's fine. So give me one moment and we will be back in a moment. Curtis Stokes & Associates is a yacht brokerage company that specializes in Great Loop capable boats. Curtis Stokes is a supporter of AGLCA at the Admiral level. If you're looking to buy or sell a Great Loop veteran from a trusted and knowledgeable broker, visit the company on the web at curtisstokes.net Email Curtis at CurtisStokes.net or call 855-266-5676. All right, we are back on Great Loop Radio. I am chatting today with Karen Nettles from the Homeport Crew, and we're talking about the many things going on in 2021. And I know we just talked about the advocacy before the uh, we played the commercial there. And I know you mentioned when you were telling what was going on with you know the, some of the obstacles of 2020. You mentioned the Illinois Illinois waterway closure. Mm -hmm. I know we've gotten some comments that have come here or emails through the office wanting to know are there going to be any waterway closures for 2021? Yes, and the short answer is there are none. No planned closures. No particularly extended planned closures. Um, that we're aware of. And we've gotten that question quite frequently in the last few weeks. We're not really sure why, although at some point while the project was going on in 2020, I did see some rumors that they didn't do it or they didn't finish because of COVID. And that's completely untrue. Um, they did, in fact, do the project as scheduled and finished it as scheduled. Now, that closure was a one step in a multi-step project. Um, so there is another closure planned on the Illinois Waterway, which also may be why there's some confusion over 2021. But that next closure is for 2023. The specific dates are not out yet. But if you are planning on looping in 2023, you definitely need to start to look out for our information coming out about that. It is projected to be a 90 to 120 day closure. So three to four months, just like we saw in 2020. And uh, from what they have described to me that the core is that the work needs to be placed in between the winter freeze and um, before the, the winter freeze basically and after uh, the prime shipping season basically. So when they first planned the 2020 closures, I was told that those were the only four months they could do it. It was closed basically July, August, September and October. So we're really expecting a very similar 
dates for the closure for 2023. So a heads up, it's a couple of years out, uh, but something to be aware of. But that is the only major planned closure that we are aware of at this time. So 2021 looks good so far from a lock well, that, closure standpoint. That's what I was getting ready to say. <laughs> at least that's one less obstacle for this year. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think this year is going to look like? Do you think there's going to be a lot of looper activity on, on the loop this year or, or what? That's, and that's another question that I am being asked a lot. And it's a tough one to answer because there is, still is so much uncertainty surrounding COVID. And the biggest piece of uncertainty really is whether the Canadian US border will open in time for loopers to really go to Canada this season. Most loopers from the US are entering Canada on Lake Ontario. Um, most do so late, ju late June to early July. Um, because you need to work your way through the Canadian parts of the route and through the Great Lakes back towards Chicago and the Inland Rivers before it gets really cold and the facilities start to shut down. So um, you need a few months for most loopers to do that, and it, uh, particularly because it is some great cruising grounds and they really want to explore the Great Lakes. So if the border doesn't open um, by like July, it would be very difficult for most loopers to enter um, Canada, like at the Trent Severn Waterway in August and still make it through the Trent Severn, Severn, through Georgian Bay, through Lake Huron and Lake Michigan before the cold weather sets in. So A, you know, will it be possible is a big question. And B, let me rephrase that. Will it be possible to go to Canada this season? Um, and B, if so, when? So for loopers who really want to do Canada as part of the Great Loop, some of them are hesitating because of the uncertainty. So some are talking about putting off their trip until 2022. Um, so I think there's this impression that because last year was a rough year for the loop and many people either stopped their loop or postponed it altogether, I think the initial thoughts out there were that the loop would be extremely crowded in 2021. I don't think that'll be the case because I think the uncertainty surrounding Canada is going to continue to be an issue. So for some folks whose boats can easily do the full length of the Erie Canal, and you need to be able to get under a 15 foot bridge to do that, they'll end up in Lake Erie and continue the loop completely in the US and have a fabulous trip. For those that can't clear that bridge, um, it gets a little bit more complicated. And the way boats accomplished it this year with the border closed um, was to take the Erie Canal to the Oswego Canal, which many loopers do. That's where you, uh, you can go, you know, 20 foot clearance. That puts you into Lake Ontario. But if you can't go to Canada, the only choice from there for those boats that can't clear the 15 foot bridges on the Western Erie is to go from Lake Ontario through the Welland Canal to Lake Erie. The problem is the Welland Canal is also in Canada. And this year, the procedure for that, um, the and it, there was a lot of confusion surrounding it because there was conflicting information. But the way it finally worked out was that um, United States citizens would had to t hire a captain, turn the boat over to the, that captain. They were not allowed to stay on board take a car and meet the boat and the captain at the other end of the Welland, which is in the US. And that was the only way to continue the loop for the boats that couldn't do the full length of the Erie Canal. So it's certainly possible to do that again. Certainly a little wrinkle if your boat can't do the 15 foot bridges on the Western Erie. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't do the loop. But again, because that is a little piece of uncertainty, I think it'll have some people choose to wait another year. So for example, if you are from uh, the west coast of Florida is where you live and keep your boat, you would want to typically be leaving that west coast of Florida in, you know, January, late January, maybe February time frame to head up the coast of Florida and, and through the intracoastal waterway in New York to get um, on your way. If you absolutely want to go to Canada or you don't want to have to deal with the headache of the Welland and it's getting to be time for you to leave Florida in February or March and the, the border still isn't open, it's going to be a very tough call. Do you leave Florida or do you wait? So I think that's long story short, there's still enough uncertainty that it will probably keep the number of boats out on the loop down a little bit in 2021. It sounds like it's going to be a case by case basis, depending on your boat and depending on the borders and everything else. So, yeah, it but. definitely will. And um, at this point, I'm in contact with um, Chad Buckner, who a lot of loopers know is a great friend to loopers. He is the um, director of canal operations for Parks Canada. So he runs the Trent Severin, um, all of the Ontario and Quebec canals for um, Parks Canada. So he's definitely got 
um, a finger on the pulse of what's happening because it certainly affects his operations, whether or not those borders are open and U.S. citizens can go to Canada. So I'm going to be checking in with him every other week at this point um, right now. And I did speak to him this week, but his guess is as good as anyone's um, as to when the border might open. The Trent Severn for our Canadian members who have their boats there and may want to do some local cruising or head towards Chicago or head towards the U.S. border in case it opens. Um, the Trent Severn will be operating as normal. Um, but obviously, if you're not Canadian or don't already have your boat there, that's that's not going to be an option until that border opens. Yeah. Well, I think we've covered a lot of stuff of what happened in 2020 and then kind of a preview of what, what we can expect this year in 2021. Is there anything else maybe we didn't go over or cover that you want to mention? I think that's just about everything, but I didn't mention how to register for Looper Palooza if that's an event you're interested in doing virtually. So if you go to greatloop.org slash looper dash palooza, I know that may be a little bit of a challenge to spell, so I'll tell you the other easier way. If you go to greatloop.org and go to the events menu, you'll see a link right there to Looper Palooza. As I said, late registration is going on now and ends on January 19th. So yeah, I think that's the bulk of the things going on. Again, send your questions or your uh, topic suggestions to podcast at greatloop.org. We would be really thankful for some suggestions from you. Karen, thanks for helping me out today. It's been nice as always chatting with you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Love to do it. (laughs) To our listeners, thanks for joining us once again on Great Loop Radio. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, safe cruising.